Okay, good evening. I'm Julie Sherwood, the Education and Engagement Manager for the Wichita Public Library. And I wanna welcome you to the second program in our fall gardening series. We're happy to be partnering on this program with K-State Research and Extension, Sedgwick County and the Master Gardeners. Hi, my name is Denise Craig and I am really happy to be making this presentation about the monarch butterfly. I've been a, a Master Gardener volunteer for a, a decade and it's really important for me that you understand I'm a volunteer. The word master probably does not apply to me so much as the word volunteer. I'm gonna be talking about uh, the butterfly. I call it the rock star of the insect world. It's like you've heard of um, gateway drugs. To me, the monarch butterfly is the gateway insect. If you come to admire the monarch butterfly, and many people do, uh, you will be more likely to look at other butterflies and other insects and to forgive them for being so icky. Now, tonight I'll be talking about why I believe we should garden for monarch butterflies. And I'll also give you some specific instructions about how to garden for monarchs. But it's important you understand, if you create a garden for monarch butterflies, you will also attract to that garden other butterflies, other beneficial insects, including the pollinators, and including the predators that kill other insects. Because to create a butterfly garden is to create a good habitat for other insects. Now they do deserve our care for a number of reasons. Uh, one in just terms of just self-interest is that you can, we can think of them as a canary in the coal mine. The monarch is being studied very intensively now by scientists all over the nation, actually all over the world. And we're learning more and more about it. It evolved in North America with uh, the milkweed. And so we know it is a North American animal. If something happens to the monarch because of climate or environment or habitat, we will see that and perhaps think that carefully about the effects on other animals, including ourselves. And then the other reason is it's important you understand, I believe passionately that backyard gardeners can make a huge difference in saving this species. And an extension of that is I believe strongly that the backyard gardener can uh, save North American wildlife. We're losing, they, animals are losing habitat all over the nation. And we can create habitat in our backyards. I want you to imagine the city of Wichita in which every backyard had a garden designed for small insect animals. And you can imagine that it would be a huge place for insects to survive. Now I'm going to talk quite a bit about how you're going to do this. You create habitat. That means create a home. In the case of the monarch, you have to grow two kinds of food. All adult, well, most adult insects anyway, uh, drink nectar and butterflies survive on the nectar of flowers. But their babies, the caterpillars uh, that hatch from their eggs, survive by eating the leaves of plants. And the monarch, the the monarch baby can only eat milkweed leaves. It has evolved over eons to survive on the milkweed and they will die if you try to feed them. They won't eat any other leaf. Now, part of creating habitat is more than just the, the food. The food will bring them to your yard, lots of flowers. But to keep them there, you have to create cover, shelter. Uh, the caterpillars and the butterflies can't be out in the wind or the cold or the dark. Um, and so what you want to also plant around those two food plants are a bunch of different kinds of perennials and flowering shrubs and understory trees and trees. You're gonna create a three-dimensional world in your backyard because insects don't live just on 18 inches above the ground where your petunias are blooming. They live up and down, and that's true for the butterfly too. And they need to hide under leaves. It's estimated that the caterpillar of the monarch perhaps hides on the back of leaves 80% of its day, and it feeds intensively the rest. The other thing you have to do, they're animals. They have to have water. And imagine the kind of water you might have in a damp sponge. They're not gonna be able to use your pool. And you, we need you to talk, think about avoiding the use of pesticides. I'm going back to this notion of why the monarch deserves our care. I have 
found that it's a magnificent animal. It weighs less than a paperclip, and yet it does a 3,000 mile round trip migration in order to survive as a species. Now, uh, this particular picture, I'm gonna address pictures now. Most of the pictures in this presentation are me, taken by me in my garden, but some of them I don't have. This is one by Monarch Watch, and uh, the reason it's such a good picture for you to see is that you can see the monarchs are flocking. That tells us instantly, if you see monarchs in a flock, it's got to be fall and they're migrating south. They've been in Canada and northern United States and they're now coming south. And we occasionally are lucky enough to have them flock and rest in our own yards, maybe in a pine tree in our own yards. It's a tropical insect. It cannot survive North American temperate winters. And so it flies to Mexico uh, where it roosts over the winter and then after it comes awakens in the spring, that'd be February, March, it heads back north and it's following the milkweed as the milkweed shoots come out. Now this migration is not easy and it isn't fast. It takes multiple generations of this animal to save its species. Every year it takes multiple generations to do this job. You can see that Mexico is a huge distance from southern Canada. You can see by this map, which is also from Monarch Watch, you can see that the, migrate, the major migration passes right over Kansas. And it passes over Kansas both when it's going north and when it's going back south. So Kansas is one of 10 really important states in the nation. Important in the fact that we, what we do can save or help the monarch species. There is a population of monarchs on the Pacific coast and they migrate to and from coastal areas and they're similar coastal mountains with cool foggy weather. In Mexico, they're near Mexico City in the mountain ranges there and they're on, on the temperatures don't get below freezing, but it remains cool and misty and foggy all the time and they uh, that's where they live. Well, actually, that's where they sleep over the winter. Now I want you to think about the role of Kansas because that we have a specific role to play for the monarch migration. Early spring <clears throat> in this migration loop is when we need to have flowers and milkweed in our yards. So the, I call, they're called the Methuselah generation. They came from, they migrated the fourth generation of the monarchs have been in Canada. They hatch, they head south. It takes them a couple months to get to Mexico. And then they roost on those trees. They essentially are interdiapause, hibernate for the winter. But they come out of hibernation in February and March, and their behavior then changes. For example, prior to that, they had not developed uh, breed, uh, sexual organisms, organs. And now they become sexually active and they start breeding and they're going to head north. It turns out that Texas and southern Oklahoma are extremely important in the migration of this animal because, for example, in, in years when Texas and, has drought, the, my, the monarch population crashes. They, it's important that they have a food sources and drought interferes with that food source. The adults have to have nectar all the way north and they, the female, once bred, has to have milkweed. She will not lay her eggs on anything except milkweed. Now the eggs will hatch, and the first generation will hatch in Texas and Oklahoma. So when they fly north, we're gonna get them about the end of April and into May and early June. That will be, they will lay eggs that become the second generation. Because what happens is that these are not Methuselahs, that the first eggs that hatch in Texas, they, when they become a butterfly, they have about five to six weeks to be alive as an adult butterfly. And in that time, they must find milkweed, they must breed, find milkweed, and lay their eggs. Now I want to show you this picture. It's, a, it's an obedient plant, and the butterflies do like the obedient plant, even though it has a deep flower. Bumblebees love it too. What I have to show you, this is a mistake I've made numerous times. I ran out with my camera, and I take a picture whenever I see an insect, and only later when I'm looking at it on a computer, I say, uh-oh, that is not a monarch. That is a viceroy, and I want you to pay attention. I think I can show you. 
Here's how you tell them apart. You see that little line right there that is running parallel to the edge of the wing? Monarchs don't have lines in their wings that run parallel to the hind edge. Now, Kansas is important, I told you this, and especially in the spring and fall for this monarch migration. We occasionally have monarchs that are there at other times during the summer. I don't understand. It's probably too late for them to get to Canada. And so in some way, in some way they straggled, uh, but they will still find your milkweed, they will still lay eggs, and they will still produce more monarchs. In, at my place in April, there are very few flowers blooming that early that are suitable for a large butterfly like a monarch. Creeping phlox is a wonderful flower and they find my creeping phlox in April. And then over, it is also hard for them to have enough milkweed in the early spring. Now the milkweed I have pictured for you is spider antelope milkweed and it's, it grows wild in Kansas, but this one planted itself on a bare spot near my yard. And it has come back now for three years and I'm trying to grow it from seed. But it has very early, it is flowering already or developing flowers uh, in the early spring and it has lots of good milkweed leaves. But my own milkweed is sometimes not that well developed. So that's been a challenge to grow my milkweed, to have mature enough plants that they're sending up shoots in early spring so that that female can find them. Now in the fall, they don't need milkweed. These are not sexually reproductive animals coming down from Canada. They're flying south to Mexico. They do not uh, breed. They do not lay eggs. What they need in the fall is nectar. So you need to have incredibly lush fall gardens with lots of flowers, and lots of nectar so they can get fat and have those great big fat abdomens that those giant butterflies get. Now, what can you do I have been working now for several years to try to get more milkweed. And one thing that I'm having some success with, at least in creating, uh, getting them to germinate, is what's called winter sowing. So I grow the, I put the seeds in, that's a cranberry jug, a cranberry juice jug that I cut in half. I take the lid off, I put in a good soil for seeds to develop, and I sow six or seven milkweed seeds. Then I seal it with duct tape and put it out in the snow, and I do that on Super Bowl Sunday. I've done it now for three years, and what amazes me is I can get almost anything to germinate and to be already like, as you see there, in the spring. I have a little more trouble getting them to set out and grow, but I get those seeds. Right now, this year's crop, I put in larger pots and I'm, I put them in my own little milkweed nursery and they're in larger pots and I'll plant them in the fall and we'll see how that does. But you have to plan ahead to have mature milkweed leaves for those breeding females. And um, good luck doing that. You also have to plan ahead to have the appropriate kinds of flowers that are in early spring. Here is some early spring milkweed. Uh, this, let's see, this is a swamp milkweed. Uh, I've had trouble growing that. This was my initial milkweed effort. And it was a beautiful plant. It was not invasive, though I feared it might be. It was, a, it was about three feet tall and it, was, it grew like a vase. And at one point it was covered with wildlife, ladybugs, ladybug larva, uh, butterflies, but, and monarch larva. This is common milkweed <clears throat> in your garden. You might want to be a little careful with it. You can see how big and coarse the leaves are, and you can see it's beginning to flower. I'll tell you two things about it. <clears throat> the flower is, has the most beautiful perfume I've ever smelled, and it just permeates that garden when it's in flower. And these leaves, I believe, are too tough for those little baby mon uh, butterfly, baby monarch caterpillars to eat. Um, so I've been told that what you need to do is cut them back, but I don't want to cut them back until they've had flowers. And by then it's a little too late for the monarch population. So I haven't solved that problem yet, but this is my trusty one. This is butterfly milkweed. It's Asclepius tuberosa and it's, you can buy it at nurseries. You can buy them in nurseries right now in this, in, in Wichita. It has two kinds of flowers. It flowers in yellow. That one's called Hello Yellow, I believe. And then it has a typically orange flower. And I have monarch caterpillars on that. I had a monarch, a big uh, fifth instar caterpillar on that last week. So it 
the, the flowers in the summer and provides nectar and then it has very dense leaves. It takes a while to get to this size. It takes, you know, two or three years to become a mature plant. Now in mid-June in Kansas, I have had caterpillars. This is on that common milkweed flower. And, but I have never seen it on a leaf. But last year and this year, I have found the monarch caterpillar on the flowers. All parts of the milkweed are poisonous and all parts make good food for a caterpillar. And in this case, it's that very lovely flower of the, of the common milkweed and it is feeding a baby, a caterpillar. Now they have an extremely high mortality rate. Um, what I'm showing you now is occurred in May 2017, and this is when I kind of knew that I had to do something about growing better milkweed. This is a butterfly milkweed. It was a pretty, it was about a two, it was a three-year-old plant, I think, and it was in early May, and it had lots of shoots on it. But what surprised me was that when I went out, I saw all of these caterpillars. These are monarch, uh, early instar caterpillars. I don't know if it's second or third instar, but they're small caterpillars. And there were 24 on this one small milkweed. Well, that had been a very cold, wet, and cloudy spring. And I had no other milkweed in my yard at all. And I doubted that there was milkweed much of anywhere because it just hadn't been a good spring. Um, I watched these every night. I'd go out and look at them and they'd be gone. And I, but the next morning they were back and as soon as the sun was out. And so I guessed that they would fall to the ground where the ground was warmer. I actually don't know. I didn't dig around looking for them. But it's really, there were no survivors. I never saw any of them get larger than this. And uh, they died. It was just not a good year for the, it was not a good spring for the monarch larvae at that, on that year. Early spring nectar in Kansas is hard to find. I live in the country and nobody can see this patch of ground. It's west of my house, west of my butterfly garden, which is, you know, in itself a questionable garden. But this is henbit. It is growing in the early spring. It and dandelions are growing in the early spring. And that provides quite a lot of nectar to those early spring insects. But not probably useful for your backyard. So again, I want to talk about what you have to do to create that habitat. The first thing you can prepare now for next um, spring. And what you can do is plant milkweed and you can find flowers to get flowers started for next spring. So you're going to plant lots of flowers and lots of milkweed. And also you can plan your cover plants. If you don't have any garden shrubs, maybe you want to introduce some of those into your garden to provide the cover. And remember that shrubs flower. Many of the shrubs have beautiful flowers and early in the spring. And some flower in the fall. So it, shrubs are a good choice and also understory trees. And you can plan to provide water and you can reduce the use of pesticides. I wanted to show you, this is again that spider antelope milkweed, which kind of fascinates me, but I want to show you right here, that's its flower. It isn't a pretty pink flower or anything. It's kind of a greenish white flower, but right in the middle of it is one of, there are only 11 insects that can live on the, uh, on the milkweed plant because it is so highly poisonous. And this is a milkweed um, beetle, and it's actually a true bug. And uh, it's that orange beetle with black markings on it very much like the monarch, orange and black, and that's called a posematic coloring. They're warning other animals. They taste badly, that they are poisonous, essentially. Now here I'm burying my soul to you, but I want to have you understand this didn't come easily for me to grow a butterfly garden, but we had a septic tank disaster. So I ended up with a piece of barren ground and I looked at it and I said, why not try a butterfly garden here? It's on that west side of my house where it's hot and sunny and I don't have a good water source. I went to the barn and found an old baby dresser. And I laid it on its back and filled it with soil because I was afraid about the invasive nature of milkweed. In my experience, that has not been the case except for common milkweed. And that common milkweed with that beautiful scented flower uh, spreads by underground rhizomes. So you might want to put that in a safe place where it can't get out, maybe fenced in by your sidewalk and I don't know, your driveway. 
But so I want you to see, this is March. There's nothing there for a monarch butterfly or her caterpillar. There is no milkweed coming up yet, and there are no flowers. But I have yarrow growing there, and I have solidago, which will flower in the fall. And uh, let's see, oh, this is, I've never seen, uh, except small butterflies on this, this is flax. So it's pathetic. But I want you to know that for as far as the wildlife is concerned, no effort is pathetic. You start it, you start it as you can with the flowers that you can, with the milkweed that you can, and you are helping that butterfly survive, that species. Now, here it is, a little bit later. I'm not certain if it's the same year, but you can see this is my swamp milkweed, pathetic compared to what it looked like when it was in its full glory. But I do have in this garden, I've got zinnias growing and some other zinnias growing, and I've got a sunflower a pathetic sunflower. I can't say that word too much. It's embarrassing to show you these pictures. But that garden produced enough habitat to produce a butterfly. Uh, I also have, yeah, here, there's my milkweed, but I believe yeah, I have a little bit of a uh, butterfly milkweed in there, but it did not survive in that dresser. And by now the dresser has decayed and is gone. Now here's what you might be able to see if you create a monarch uh, garden or a butterfly garden. This is its life cycle. And this again came from um, Monarch Lab out of the University of Minnesota. But um, the female will lay an egg on a, mon on a milkweed. She will not lay the egg anywhere else. She likes to lay one at a time on one plant. And if you want to search for them, they'll be on the back of the leaves. Uh, she hides them. Now that egg's gonna be there for three to five days. It will hatch and it will produce the teeny, tiny larva uh, in butterflies and moths. That larva is referred to as caterpillar. Uh, that caterpillar is only the size of an aphid. It is tiny. That it's going to now turn into an eating machine and it will eat milkweed for two weeks maybe. And it will grow and it will, um, shed its, it will grow out of its skin and get larger. And it does that five times. So the first baby is called the first instar. And then the last one before it becomes a, uh, turns into a butterfly is called the fifth instar. And it's done that shedding thing five times. But first before it's gonna now, it has jade. I did, that's a verb that people who grow monarchs talk about. It attaches to wherever it intends to build its chrysalis. And from this point on, it cannot move again. It is completely helpless in that position. Now it will be in this position. It uh, takes about 10 to 15 minutes until it gets the full chrysalis. And then there'll be several hours before that chrysalis hardens. But it is extreme. Uh, predator insects can get to it at this time, uh, particularly predator wasps and predator flies that lay their eggs on it, and it cannot, uh, it cannot protect itself against them. All right, so the chrysalis two weeks later, you'll see this chrysalis, this brilliant, it's going to turn a brilliant green. It will turn dark, and that means the monarch is developing in there. This is complete metamorphosis, and it will come out of that, it will break out of that chrysalis, and that's called eclosing. I've read a lot about, from people who raise monarchs devoutly. And now, this is important, it will be an adult, a breeding adult for two to five weeks, and then it dies. So the life of this monarch just got serious. It has to find more, it has to find a spouse, and then the, the female has to find milkweed, and she has to lay eggs. And she has a very short time frame in which to do that. Notice it's completely unlike the Methuselahs. The Methuselahs that came from Canada, it took them two months to get down there. They're, at, they're hibernating for months down there and they can get to be eight months old. But it's only that last generation that flies south that has that kind of age span. These guys are just moseying north, you know, one garden at a time. Now, if you're lucky, and I want you to understand, you can tell, look at this, this is a sunflower. It's a pathetic plant, but I grew that caterpillar on my pathetic swamp milkweed, and it's found, what they do after they get to this size is they wander. It leaves the food plant 
and try and abandon it. They're going to find a place away from the food source to turn into a chrysalis. And it found the back of a sunflower leaf. And you can see there's not a lot of cover there. That's probably the only reason I saw it in the first place. But if you are lucky, you will see that. And then you will see what I think is the most beautiful natural thing I have ever seen is that chrysalis with that, those, that gold band on it. And it, it, it was stunning to me. I could not believe anything could be so beautiful. And then I didn't see her break out, but I did get there in time. She hadn't completely, her wings hadn't completely strengthened and filled with fluid. So there is the chrysalis underneath that leaf. And there she is getting her wings strong enough to fly. And she hung around my house then. It was late, it was late August when this happened. So she didn't make it to Canada. And I don't know if she's gonna turn around and make it to Mexico, but she lived around, she drank a lot of nectar around my house that fall. And, I, and it was this boldly colored, beautiful, fresh butterfly. And it came from my swamp milkweed experiment in my very first pathetic butterfly garden. I say that because I don't want you to be afraid of gardening for animals. Um, anything that you do is better than what they have. They have lost about a million acres per year of natural habitat, Ameri North American wildlife. A million acres per year is gone. And the monarch itself has now, it's down to 2% of the total native habitat that it had eons ago. So this garden is better than zero. And I'm getting better. Now in Kansas, in your backyard, in early spring, this is your mantra. Plant, 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 and more plants. If there is no nectar, there is no food for the adult butterflies. If there is no milkweed, we won't have monarchs, period. But look at this. Now this is, you've seen my pathetic garden. Now I'm showing you a shot of a part that I want my whole place to look like. And I will confess, it doesn't. But every now and then, I'll get a corner of a garden that looks pretty good. This is that hello yellow butterfly milkweed. It is now a very mature plant and takes up of a space, probably it's spread out to maybe three feet and maybe two and a half or three feet tall, like a small shrub. And it's covered in the summer with these flowers, which all the insects love. And then of course, my other favorite flower is the coneflower, which reseeds itself now wherever it wants. And they're coming up in all places. Actually, I'm becoming brutal with coneflower because it may be in places that I have wanted another flower to grow. But I have a really nice little vignette there. As, and I'd like you to imagine that much of my garden looks that way. But in truth, this is back to my butterfly garden on the west side of my house. Now it's better than it was. This is a picture I took a couple weeks ago this summer. And already I have this big giant liatra that the butterflies love and it's in flower. And I've got pretty, um, I'm not having much luck this year with uh, the Gloriosa daisy type uh, biennial uh, Rudbeckia. And it's, uh, I'm not having a lot of luck with those this year. And there, of course, are my milkweeds, which have been uh, overshadowed and shaded by sunflower. I allow morning glory to go wherever it wants and tear it out when I don't want it. This is Solidago getting ready to flower for fall, but not yet flowering. So it's closer to the goal. I need more flowers in that garden, but I have other gardens that have flowers in them. But it, I do have a lot of dense cover now. Uh, there are a lot of leaves in there and it's pretty dense and it's almost so dense that in some places weeds couldn't grow and uh, in other places I, it's pretty hard to weed. I'm on my hands and knees to do that. Now remember I told you this is like a canary in the coal mine because uh, it's a small animal. It lives in North America. It actually migrates through most of North America. So if things happen to our world, we might see it happen first to the monarch. And one of the dangers everyone says might be facing the monarch is uh, climate change. And nobody knows quite what it might do, but we know it's gonna go one way or the other. If there are wetter and colder winters in Mexico, if those temperatures in those mountains fall below freezing, there are millions of butterflies that will simply freeze to death there. And that is a bad outcome. Uh, monarchs cannot fly in the cold. So if it gets colder, uh, they have to have a, over 60 degrees 
uh, before they can even consider flying. And remember, at 55 degrees, they're just they're going to go under a leaf and just hang out. They are not going to move around. I want to show you again liatris on uh, uh, the monarch on liatris. They really come to that flower. And now I have some that bloom more in the spring and the early summer, and then I have this one that blooms in the late fall. And uh, I mean, the late summer and fall. And what if climate turns warmer? Well, the danger there, people speculate, okay, to, they're following milkweed. Well, if it's too hot and dry in Texas, they're going to have to go further north. And if they just keep having to follow that milkweed further north, away from drought and heat and sun that won't grow their milkweed, or, uh, or and then the milkweed might grow better, say, in southern Canada. What they're imagining is, what if it could... What if the butterfly could adapt and keep flying north, maybe into a fifth generation instead of just a fourth generation? That'd be great uh, that it would be adaptive. But then they say, uh-oh, now it's further north. When that generation, when that Methuselah generation hatches in the north, will they be strong enough and able to make it back to Mexico? And of course, we hope the Mexican habitat would still be there. Now this is one of my favorite flowers in the fall, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it several times. It's a tall sedum, and it's a it's kind of a gangly one. It's not it's not one of the neat new cultivars of sedum. It has got that white flower with the pink center, but I don't, it blooms later in the fall than other tall sedums. So when these animals, you can see that's a great big monarch, and it's and they are all over that sedum in the fall because the nectar sources. And we'll talk more about how they produce nectar. Other dangers, the deforestation in Mexico was of course a really serious problem, but about the year two, by the year 2000, the Mexican government created about, oh, almost 300 acres of uh, monarch preserve. And it's important, it's not a single plot of land. There are numerous mountains out there on which the monarchs uh, flock and hang out. And so there are actually 11 sites where the monarch is in a preserve and protected. And the people of Mexico have always admired the monarch and are becoming more attuned to it. And again, I mentioned habitat loss in the United States. One thing I did not point out to you, it, on that early map, you saw that uh, the monarch migrates from Kansas north and it goes through uh, the corn belt of the United States, the upper Midwest. And what happened in, 1990s, in 1996, it's been studied so much that they know how to, from the chemicals in a butterfly that they take, that they capture in Mexico, the chemicals tell them where the caterpillar ate the milkweed leaves. So in 1996, they discovered that 50%, half of all the monarch butterflies in Mexico had eaten their milkweed in the corn belt. But in 1997, GMO type soybeans were developed and apparently farmers uh, double crop, they grow corn and soybean, but the soybean crops were always plagued by weeds. So they designed a soybean that was um, immune to uh, Roundup. And then they could spray those fields with Roundup and after the corn, they could get a really good soybean crop. And that's truly wonderful. But the fact is, all of the milkweed that grew in those soybean fields died. So they lost a lot of food that way, which is why uh, Chip Taylor at KU is asking backyard gardeners to create monarch uh, waste stations. Think of it as a a stopping place, a rest stop along the highway, where at your place, at your garden, it can get water and food and shelter. Um, and it's huge migration. And that uh, to make up for that lost habitat. He has, uh, a couple years ago, I read this, he had 9,000 uh, registered way, monarch way stations, but he believes we need 9 million. So there's room for all of us to grow gardens, and I sort of imagine your gardens won't be as rustic as my initial ones were. There are more dangers, and they're absolutely unique to the monarch, and one of these is that they 
survive and can only survive their caterpillars on the incredibly poisonous leaves of the milkweed. This, uh, and the milkweed evolved to prevent herbivores like caterpillars from eating the leaves. Plants don't want to be eaten. And um, the, butter, the monarch developed ways to eat it and not being damaged by the poison. But uh, the plant also has a latex, that uh, white milky sap, that latex sap. That's another one of its defenses against animals that would like to eat it. And what we know now is that half of all the monarch eggs that hatch, that little tiny aphid-sized caterpillar takes its first bite of milkweed and the sap flows out and they either drown or they're stuck in it. They're so tiny, they get stuck in it. And then that latex sap, of course, hardens. And then they're stuck there and they die. Half of all monarch babies die at their first bite. It's, it's a stunning detail. There are only 11 species that can eat this poisonous plant um, and not sicken and die. Um, Three of them eat the seeds. I showed you one, the, um, the uh, beetle or the true bug. And there are two of those. One of them is larger and one of them is smaller and they eat seeds. And then there's a weevil, an orange colored weevil. They all take on that coloring uh, of the monarch, that uh, orangey bright color. And they're saying, don't bite me, I taste bad. There are three species of suckers and those are aphids. I have, uh, uh, I was familiar with the orange ones. It turns out the bright orange aphids feed at the, at the tips of the new growth of milkweed. And uh, they have been the bane of my existence. But I did not realize there were two other species feasting on my poor milkweed. Uh, and I have found since then one of them. I have, one of them is a almost transparent one, but the ants take care of it. And that's feeding lower on the milkweed. And then the last one is uh, kind of brown and it feeds at the base. There are five animals that chew the leaves. This moth, which is the tussock moth, which one year completely destroyed my butterfly milkweed. Um, that moth laid a whole bunch of eggs and then ate every leaf on my plant, but the plant came back. Uh, the monarch caterpillar is a chewer. There's a leaf mining fly. And now that I know that, its larva is between the edges, between the top and the bottom layers of the leaf. And I now can see the marks of that leaf miner on some of my milkweed. There's a longhorn beetle and its larvae eat the roots, which are also poisonous. And then there's a milkweed leaf beetle and it feeds completely differently than the other animals. Uh, I've never seen one, but I learned how it feeds and down the big, uh, the central spine of a milkweed leaf. Uh, it takes teeny tiny bites right in a row on that central spine and that causes the sap to flow there and then that creates a space on the leaf nearby where the um, there is no sap and that beetle can eat and it leaves a characteristic kind of u-shaped hole in that leaf. The monarch caterpillar has to eat dangerous food but they have evolved over eons to figure out how to do it and to prosper. Now I want you to show us to see these orange aphids. This is my common milkweed and it's beautiful flower. And it is of course being destroyed by aphids. And um, I don't use pesticides on them, but I've become ruthless. My early swamp milkweed was destroyed by all the aphids I allowed to grow on it, to eat it. Um, what I would do is I would simply run my fingers up and down the leaves. You can see those, I would crush those and I end up having yellow fingers and they end up being squashed. And I do that on all the leaves. I could not figure out a way to save that flower. Um, but when I see, I, I check my milkweed all the time and I check the tips. I didn't know about the other aphids and the, these orange, they're very visible and they're right on the tips and they're on the new growth and I just squash them, of course. I, I'm not careful. I should be no better, but on the back, I should check the back of those leaves because there might be a monarch egg that I'm also squashing. There might be a ladybug set of eggs that I'm squashing. And of course, the um, first instar monarch caterpillar is the size of an aphid and I might be squashing it. I just haven't, 
I've not yet taken out, you know, anything to examine those leaves before I start squashing. I just hope that something survives. Here are some other feeding strategies of uh, the caterpillar. This is one I saw just two weeks ago. I didn't, I watched him. It was an accident that I saw him. I was seated at the base of our deck and I turned to the left and there was this giant monarch caterpillar on my butterfly milkweed. And he was chewing the part of the leaf that attaches to the stem. He was chewing that. I could clear, I was close to him and I could see him chewing that stem, uh, that connector. And pretty soon the leaf dropped down so that it's now hanging vertically from the branch where it was. And then he eventually turns around and he has stopped the flow of latex into that leaf. And now he will happily graze on that leaf and he grazes from the bottom up and he grazes on only one side of the leaf. And that's a strategy for a large butterfly to control latex. But here are some other things that I find fascinating. It's a magnificent animal. The female chooses, she's the one who lands on the plants and decides, oh, this is a, she, she's testing the leaves she lands on with her feet and her antennae. And she's testing, is this a milkweed plant? But she's testing more in a more sophisticated way. She's saying, is this a milkweed plant that has lots of poison? Because milkweeds vary. Some of them have very little of the toxin in them and some of them have a great deal of toxin. What she chooses when she has a chance is to, she lays her egg on the milkweed plant that has just the right amount of toxin. Not the one with the most poison and not the one with the least poison. Now, there's another thing, and this is brand new research that no one could imagine. Um, they called it self-medicating, but of course the female is the one who decides where the caterpillar will be and where it will eat. If a monarch female is infected with this parasite, it's called OE because no one can pronounce it. And that parasite uh, stunts their growth. Sometimes just uh, sometimes they die of it, but it, they don't get big and they don't develop well. They don't, they're not good, healthy animals. If she is infected with that parasite and she is given a choice of different kinds of milkweed plants. She lays her eggs on the most poisonous leaves she can find. And those are Asclepias curasophica, and that's tropical milkweed, which I did not realize had the most toxin in it, but it does. We can grow it here like an annual. You don't even plant it until after May, well after May 1st. It has to be warm or they won't even, uh, they won't germinate. And uh, of course, then you're not gonna have a lot of milkweed leaf because you've planted them so late, but you will have in the fall, you'll have all summer, you'll have milkweed leaves and you will also have those milkweed flowers, the pretty flowers. Now, and the, the research continued, I'm sorry. Research continues and the larvae, the OE parasites are not able to influence the larvae in a, in a damaging way, as they would if they had been eating less poisonous food. Now, <clears throat> you know this, but why do they eat poisonous leaves? Because that prevents them from being eaten. They become themselves toxic, and that's sort of the miracle. And then they advertise that they're toxic with their coloration. They feed in daylight, in broad daylight, because once the birds learn you bite into a monarch butterfly, it's bitter, it's nasty. And if you swallow it, you vomit. It's a terribly effective poison. It's so effective that other insects uh, mimic it. And here we have, again, a viceroy that looks so much like a monarch from a distance, it's fooling me all the time. I do take pictures of all animals, <clears throat> but I want you to see that line in its wings that no monarch ever has. Now these scientists, I love the science and they're studying everything about it. They're asking all the questions that were never asked before. So they say, okay, in Mexico, there are millions of big fat butterflies hanging on trees and they're sleeping. That is an incredibly rich food source for the animals of Mexico in a cold winter. 
He says, surely something eats them. Well, it turns out the scientists have to that several animals do eat them. And they develop strategies also to cope with the poison in these butterflies. The black-backed Oreo butchers the butterflies. And it actually then cuts open its abdomen and it only eats the contents of the abdomen. And it doesn't eat any of the cuticle because the butterfly has what they call sequestered. The poison that the monarch eats is sequestered. It sends it to parts of his body that have nothing to do with vital organs. And the poison in this leaf um, does affect uh, the heart and vomiting. And it sends it away from those areas. Another bird, the black-headed grosbeak, removes the wings because they have a lot of poison in them. And it does eat the whole body of the monarch. But the scientists watched it, it would feast maybe for as long as a week, and then not eat any at all. And so they don't know this, and we'll have to continue to find out what's happening, but they imagine that it gets sick and then has to go recover from eating, feasting on those monarch bodies for a week. The poison in this leaf is a cardinality. It's called cardinality. It's a steroid. And it affects an enzyme which has an incredible a chemical, the, the biochemistry of it I didn't get, but it affects what's called the sodium pump. Now, all animals, including humans, have a sodium pump. So that poison in that milkweed would affect us too. Now, how are you gonna create habitat? There's one rule you'll start with, and that is you provide food. They must have food. That's how you will attract them to your garden. Um, I've said repeatedly, you will plant, 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 but what will get the adult butterfly is the flowers. And you won't have single flowers, you'll have swaths. You have to have large patches of flower. They're flying over your yard and other yards and they have to look down and say, oh my God, that looks like a food source. And then they'll come down to your yard. And then, of course, you have to be ready for the monarch. There has to be host plants. And that would be the, you have milkweed. You've planted lots of milkweed in your yard, too. Now, the thing about the flowers, you want them to bloom continuously. But flowers don't do that for us. So you actually will have several species of flowers that you grow in the early, for the early spring, which the monarch needs. But then you'll continue to grow a different set of flowers, a species that will flower in the summer. And then there will be a completely distinct set of species that will flower in the fall. Now you can also remember supplement all of this all the time with annuals because they flower pretty beautifully for us. This is the tropical milkweed, the one that has the most poisonous leaves that I did try to grow from seed. And it produced the scrawniest plants, little tiny 18 inch plants that had barely any leaves. But I tell you, it's a very pretty flower and insects and butterflies did nectar on it. And then look at that. Monarchs found it and laid eggs on it. And this is in the summer. And I don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, it's not going to make it to Canada. And I don't know if it would be able to go south. But it's going to be, uh, it's going to eat milkweed leaves and turn into a monarch butterfly. I don't know what that one's future is. The other important rule, if there is no milkweed, there will be no monarchs. That is their babies. Uh, it's the essential food for babies. I want to show you, uh, this is that antelope a spider and milkweed that grew itself in my yard. It planted itself in a, a bare spot. And I wanted to show you the milkweed beetle. It is a true bug. You can see that dark area. But I want you to see its children. The parents, the parents in the milkweed beetle species stay with the babies. And these, these are pretty, these have grown up pretty far. They're big, but they still are just a big orange beetle with black dots and they don't have their wings yet but they do stay with their young. Now this is one I've never yet seen a flower. It's an 18 month old plant that two winters ago, I planted in my little uh, cranberry jug greenhouse and I germinated it and it's taken this long, but I have a great big, nice plant. It still isn't good enough. I never have had flowers on it yet, but that's a showy milkweed and it's gonna have beautiful flowers and it's kind of a grayer. It's a grayer leaf, and it does have animals feeding on it, but I did not see monarchs on it. 
Now, the other thing you're going to know is that aphids do love milkweed. You will have to deal with them. But remember, if you kill all the aphids, you will kill all the predators that eat aphids. And that includes the one that you love, which is the ladybug. And this is on, uh, this is my poor swamp milkweed, which remember was covered with living things. There is the a set of aphids and they're growing, they're there. And right there, that is a ladybug larva. And it's black and orange and it looks like a little crocodile. But that means that a ladybug laid eggs on this plant and it hatched and that dude eats aphids all day long. And it eats as many as the adult ladybug. And this is a flower of a swamp milkweed and it's a very pretty flower, as you can see. Now this is that hello yellow Asclepius tuberosa and that is a monarch nectarine on it. And it flowers during the summer. It has stopped flowering now, um, but it flowered all summer long. Here's a common milkweed. I've warned you about it. The big coarse leaves, the wonderful flower and the scented flower. Um, but it is sending up shoots in early spring. And I haven't, uh, I haven't seen monarchs on it. I haven't seen monarch caterpillars. And I'm showing you this picture because this is the seed pod of the common milkweed. And I wanted you to see there is that milkweed beetle. And there is an earlier stage of the insect. It's a tinier little orange beetle with black dots. What you need to know is it doesn't eat the leaves. It doesn't eat the flowers. It will, I do have to watch them so I can save some pods for seeds because they will eat all the seed pods. But uh, it doesn't damage the plant and doesn't eat anything else in the garden. Here's that tropical milkweed, you know, scraggly, short, covered with aphids. There's a caterpillar. Actually, at one point, I found three or four caterpillars on one of these scroggly things that had no leaves left. And so at that point, I intervened. I picked up a couple of them and took them to a different plant that had more leaves. But again, I was learning. I have to have more leaves. And then you can see on these, it would be really fairly easy just to squeeze those things, just squish, squish, squish all around the stem. Here's my spider antelope horn. You can see it has a green flower and it, it kind of lays, reclines along the ground. I'm going to try to grow that in my garden. It does not appear to be invasive and I've got beetles eating all the seeds, so it doesn't look like it's going to reseed. So again, what we're going to do is we have to, if we want to help the monarchs as a species, we grow milkweed for the babies and that will be particularly, it must be in the early spring. And by that I mean the end of April, May, in early June. And then you're going to have flowers from the end of April, clear through uh, fall, October, November, because those flowers are going to feed the adult butterflies, they're going to feed the adult monarch, they're going to feed all the adult in insects. And you'll uh, do that in spring and fall. Now, I want to show you, this is a picture of, again, my creeping fox. And I, I was stunned. It, it was so early. It was April. And it was so early, I had very, I had no flowers, and I hadn't seen any insects. Sometimes it's cold; you don't see insects in the cold. And, but look at her. First of all, it's a big butterfly. Second of all, look, it's faded. It's faded and worn. So I've looked at that. The only other flowers, by the way, again that were blooming at this time were henbit and dandelion at my place. I believe she's a Methuselah, because if she had. If, she, if that Methuselah lays eggs in Texas, um, say in April, and, and late March and April, I don't think her eggs could be developed and in my yard and it produce a worn butterfly in, in April. I think it's a Methuselah. So she made it all the way to Kansas. And I had no milkweed for her. That, that I had no milkweed. Now, early spring nectar plants that you might want to think about growing, and you may have more experience uh, than I do in this area. I, don't, I had said, do not forget shrubs. This is a dogwood shrub, and uh, I think you might find better shrubs. I live in the country, and I, it uh, produces berries. It, it's really a wonderful wildlife food, so I let it go. You might find a different shrub, but please notice how many flowers it has and how many leaves it has. It's going to provide shelter and nectar, and it is in early May. 
This is my geranium plant, which produces a nice little plant with nice little flat flowers. Uh, again, and it's, these are all from early May pictures. Here's Allium. And uh, it will be up and early. And then this surprised me because Gallardia will bloom later in the year, of course. But if, if you've got a mature plant, it might be producing flowers in, by May also. So the idea is you have a mature garden, a mature garden of perennials that you can predict pretty much when they are going to uh, flower. And then you also supplement it constantly with all those uh, annuals that you can buy, a packet at a time for two bucks. And you can plant those and you get these wonderful annuals that will also support the nectar eating animals. Here are more spring flowers and this is a liatra. And uh, there's my monarch, but there's a, a silver spotted skipper that butterflies and bees love. And then here, that's the dame's rocket. It's a, it's not a native plant, but it's been naturalized in the United States. The uh, early people brought it from Europe and it is an early spring flowering plant and it plants itself wherever it wants and I just now know to pull it uh, if I don't want it growing someplace. Here is my uh, orange, orange flowered butterfly milkweed. It's a pretty nice plant, but it doesn't have its, fl its flowers aren't there yet, but her flowers are beautiful. Now I've come to love cone flowers with all my heart. If they are, if they're perennial and mature in your garden, they're coming up in the spring and the early spring, you're going to have early flowers. Um, but they can also grow through the summer and you can plant them from seed and have them in the summer and the fall. Here is a big, when I talked about a swath of, I've never been able to have a swath of flowers before, but I have a swath of coneflower. Uh, they just keep reseeding and I keep letting them reseed. Now this is also a coneflower, but it's an unusual one. It's called Missouri coneflower or Ozark coneflower or yellow coneflower. You can see it has a slightly different structure. And the interesting thing is, I'm having trouble getting more of those plants to go, to pop. I actually I was able to germinate a lot of their seeds from this plant. I took seeds and I germinated a lot of seeds, but I wasn't able, they're not alive now. My milkweeds are, but I, I transplanted them. I did everything I thought right. And I, I'm gonna have to learn more about how to grow them because I didn't do it right. Common milkweed, I want to show you again. I want to show you how pretty those flowers are. And I want to remind you, if you like perfume in your garden, you will want to figure out a way to contain its roots so you can have that plant. I want to point out that hollyhock, it's a pretty flower and it seeds itself and I don't find it too much, but it provides absolutely no nectar to anything because it has so many petals, the insects can't get to the nectar and pollen producing parts. And here is my orange mil butterfly milkweed. I wanted you to see the orange flower up close. And you can see it has a very pretty leaf and it's a, a waxy kind of leaf. It doesn't have the hairy thing that these other leaves have on them. Now well, let's talk about favorite late fall flowers because there are some favorites and that butterfly is migrating oh, oh, well over a thousand miles and it's got to stop and drink nectar to stay fat and keep to, to, keep its weight up, to keep up its synergy, and to produce fat for when it's hibernating in Mexico. Here's that tall sedum I told you about, and it attracts all kinds of butterflies, flies, insects, wasps, um, some of the unusual predator insects I've found on that tall sedum. And I know now why. It grows late in the fall, and these insects are eating as much as they can to to prepare their nests for their eggs to survive the winter. Almost all of them are gonna die. They will not live, the insects will not live through the winter. Uh, remember that monarch wouldn't live through the winter, but it's gonna migrate. But this one has gotta prepare a way for its species to survive. And it needs that nectar uh, to lay its eggs or uh, produce, I don't know how the painted lady survives. Here's a, this is that tall variegated leaf sedum. And again, I'll repeat, I've looked online for variegated leaf sedum tall with white flowers, pink centers. And it's called, that description is called Frosty Moor. And here is my New England Aster, which I love, which is a gangly, horrendous plant that you have to remember. I usually am able to remember to cut it back on July 4th. I cut it about in half, but I read somewhere I could cut it twice. 
bring it twice back in. I would, it would not be so lanky and so horrible. Uh, so this year, I think I cut it in May and then again in June. But it is still lanky and the mildew gets to it and it's all leggy looking and awful. But in the fall, in October, when these animals must have nectar, it is covered. And I'm talking about thousands of blossoms. My sister has a bunch of New England aster growing that has to be more than thousands. You can hear the plant buzzing from the bees on it. There will be bees and there will be um, butterflies. One September I counted seven species of butterfly on one 15 minute sunny September afternoon. But here I've got three monarchs. There were more than three on it, but I couldn't, they're fluttering everywhere. So if you have a place where you can grow this kind of lanky plant for the fall, you're gonna produce a lot of late fall nectar. There are other asters and they produce nectar and that's fine. But this one seems to go uh, flowers later in the fall than the other cultivars of aster that I've grown. Now here, two plants can be grown from seed. This one is the Maximilian sunflower. It is a perennial and it will come back, but it recedes horrendously. So you really have to control it. That's a great big tall plant, but you, I love the flower and I love the way it is on the, the stems are lined with flowers all the way up like a bouquet. But the, the weight gets so great to lay down, it, it's not a perfect garden plant. So if you can find a place where it can be supported and grow in sunlight, you will love it. And the, the animals love it. By the way, this is a fall flowering plant. So look at the size of that monarch. And you can kind of estimate the size because that's a soldier beetle. That soldier beetle's maybe three quarters of an inch, uh, six, eight, uh, you know, five eighths of an inch long. That is a huge animal. That's a Methuselah and she's flying south. She's gonna make it to Mexico. Oh, wait, is it a she? Yes, it is. Right here, I believe is the spot, would be a black dot if it was a male. Here is the Mexican sunflower called Tetonia. Now, the thing about that Tetonia is that you can grow it from seed and it produces this really, it's a little more manageable and it's a very pretty flower. And it grows in the fall. Now the struck, I told you that it's uh, to get the flowers that are most suitable for a monarch, which is a large, a large butterfly. Uh, they like a landing platform. This sunflower is a, provides a big platform for a big animal to land on. These zinnias also, but more than that, and this is the secret for having a good garden for insects, you plant flowers that have what's called a composite structure. Sunflowers and zinnias are excellent flowers to show you. When we look at that plant, we see a single sunflower. We say, oh, isn't that a pretty flower? It is not a single flower. You know, because we know about sunflower seeds, that it, these are the disc flowers. And in some sunflowers, here's, they will produce a thousand disc flowers in here. Now here's what you need to know. Each of those is producing nectar because nectar invites an insect to come. But once the insect has had the nectar and pollinated the flower, the flower produces no more nectar in that spot because it's now going to work on producing a seed in that spot. But look, there are several hundred other places that are nectar sources. In a composite flower, you can see it on the zinnia, there are many, many places on a single flower to get nectar. And that's why they're, they're really valuable plants when you're trying to feed insects. Uh, do some research, for example, even on coneflowers, which are similar, it's a similar composite, uh, but coneflowers are being made into other prettier flowers. I saw one at the store that had this great, big, beautiful, puffy top, lots and lots of pretty petals. It was a gorgeous flower. But when they breed them that way, they probably took over pollen or nectar structures. So while it's a beautiful flower that will grace your garden, it will not feed an animal will not feed a butterfly or any other pollinator. These are more composites. Of course, the mum is a composite. This is a mum that was uh, among a display at Lowe's, and these yellow mums were covered with multiple species of flower and in the late fall. And by the way, there were other colors of mums, uh, like the rust ones, but the butterflies were all on the yellow. Uh, this is another zinnia. 
And this one just grew itself from seed for years in my garden. And, but it kept, uh, I kept using wood mulch and it kept moving. And I don't have this one anymore. But you, remember, zinnias grow and they grow well and easily from seed. So you can produce a lot of zinnia flowers for the fall and provide these guys with the food they need. Rebecca grow from seed. Here is my favorite tall sedum again. And you can see it's a magnificent landing platform for that animal. And uh, they love the nectar um, in that sedum. And in the late fall, I'm talking about in October, she will be sharing that spot with, uh, with other insects. These are more composites, uh, hyssop and liatras and uh, that is a queen butterfly who is related to the monarch, but she doesn't migrate. Uh, she lives in the south of us and just occasionally will come to Kansas. This is also a composite flower with multiple sources of nectar. Food will bring them to your garden, but habitat keeps them in your garden. This is another view at a different time of my butterfly garden. And you can see it doesn't look quite as pathetic as before. Remember that you're going to give them habitat, which means flowers for food and uh, milkweed for food, but you're also going to give them cover. Look at this dense, that's a uh, Maximilian sunflower covered with morning glories. The butterfly will not get nectar out of a morning glory, but your bees will. And there is that, I wanted you to remember, shrubs will provide lots of nectar and, sh uh, and shelter. Don't forget the water. You can create a simple puddle. Um, besides a damp sponge. Uh, it would have to be in a wind protected site, uh, sunlight, uh, shallow, sand and gravel, very, just damp, you, they can't get wet. And you can sprinkle table salt on it or compost on it. And the animals will take the minerals out of that. And all of them will take those minerals. But in the case of the monarch and some other breeds, uh, Butterflies puddle, they get those minerals and those salts, and they give them to the female when they mate. And it's in the interest of the female. It, may, it gives her more nourishment. It makes her eggs more uh, better, more and better. And the larvae, the science says the larvae are stronger. Avoid the use of pesticides. I want you to think of them as friendicides. If you kill pests with a pesticide, you're also killing other beneficial insects. Okay, create habitat by providing food, by also having more plants uh, planted in a third dimension that includes vine shrubs and ground cover, avoid pesticides, and uh, provide moisture. This is another annual verbena bonariensis. It is not a native, but it grows from seed and as you and the butterflies love it. All right, do you have questions? I do want to point out I've got that viceroy on an obedient plant. Look at that. That line parallel to the back of the wing. Here is a monarch, there is no such line. I don't know what flower that one is on. It's hideous, but she's up in the discs getting the, the nectar out of those disc flowers. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I do wanna um, tell you that there were two books that I really enjoyed. This one I used, Pollinator Friendly Gardening. It's just a, a small book, cost about 20 bucks. Uh, I got it at Barnes & Noble a few years ago. A former master gardener from this area wrote it and it's complete and teaches you about how to grow the flowers, what bugs you can, what insects you can expect. It's just a really thorough general overview. This one is my new book that was just published. It told me all about the biochemistry of the milkweed. And I, if you really love the science, you, you might enjoy reading this one. It's a beautifully written science book. Well, thank you, Denise. Really enjoyed your presentation. Um, one of our first questions tonight is, when you were talking about the water puddles for the butterfly, um, how do you prevent mold from growing in those water puddles? Um, I. I tried using decayed fruit and that it created that problem for me. So you have to clean the dish. It's shallow. It should be shallow water. It actually should evaporate every day and you would have to add fresh water. Um, you have to tend it. Um, but they, they go by the side of a, a mud puddle after a spring rain. You'll see them there puddling. Uh, you do have to be careful, but it isn't a big problem because the water is so shallow. 
Do you have any more success with keeping that water dish in the sun versus the shade? Uh, they like it in the sun. They aren't active in the shade. And um, the thing is, I don't, if you put it in the sun, it evaporates more quickly. But that's, you put it in your butterfly garden where it's all sheltered and just try to remember to get back there to keep renewing the water because it will be evaporating. It's very, very shallow. They cannot get wet. Very good. Our next question is, can you again remind our audience how to tell the difference between a male and a female monarch by their markings? Um, yeah, I thought I had a picture of a male, but I don't seem to. But I believe it's, it might be right in here. I don't have one, but there, if you're looking at a monarch, you have a picture of them, there will be a black dot where those lines intersect, and you will be able to see it. Um, just a it looks like two black dots on either side of the on, on the wing. I didn't happen to have any male pictures here. I'm sorry about that. Now I, I may as well show you here um, monarchwatch.org. You can learn a lot from them. The monarchlab.org. This monarch watch, they actually uh, ask citizen scientists to report. Do you, did, when is your first sighting of milkweed shoots? Uh, when did you see your first butterfly or your first monarch? Uh, when did you see in your yard, in your location, when did you see um, the first egg on a milky plant? And they're using citizen scientists to study it. They're gathering enormous amounts of data about this animal. Very good. The next question we have is what are the sun requirements for growing the best types of flowering or food plants for the monarchs? So I think a lot of the plants that you mentioned, kind of what are the general sun requirements? Sun requirements? Um, they like sun. They like a lot of sun. Uh, I'm trying to think. My uh, cone flowers in my butterfly garden did not grow well this year because the sunflowers completely shaded them. They're growing beautifully where they have sun. The Maximilian, all sunflowers want sun. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm growing anything in the shade. Nope. Not, not if I want those flowers. Well, maybe violets. Well, but the violets are for the fritillary. Um, that early spring flower is hard to do. I'm imagining there might be other, um, other gardeners who might have a favorite spring flower that would product, provide that flat platform and lots of nectar for this big butterfly. Yep, I'd agree with you. When I think of a lot of those plants you mentioned, the full sun is definitely where I think a lot of those plants would be best grown. Um, one of our participants said they have mostly common milkweed that grows in their garden and usually have lots of monarch caterpillars in the past. They haven't seen any this year though, and so do you have any thoughts on maybe something they could consider? Well, you know, um, one source I read told me that I should uh, trim them back, cut them back so that they produce smaller leaves. And I love the flower though, so I don't like to cut them back. Um, maybe it's, the leaf is big and of course, but apparently that viewer has had monarch caterpillars on the leaves. I've never seen one on a leaf, only on the flowers of that, uh, of that uh, common milk. Okay. Um, they said, thank you for that information. Um, do you know, do monarch butterflies like poppy flowers? They would. It's a flat flower. Um, I'm pretty certain they would. Uh, my poppies always seem to be floppy. So it has to be strong enough to hold their weight. I, I don't know if, which variety, maybe poppies other people grow are stronger. Very good. Our next question is, do you know if there are any particular colors that the monarch butterfly is more attracted to? And I, I think they're asking in relation to like flower color. Uh, no, I don't, except for that one. This is completely anecdotal, non-scientific. Of that time I was in a buck store and they had all of those mums out and it was late fall and they had giant tables of mums and all of the butterflies were on the yellow mums. They had the similar flower, so I thought, well, what kind? Of, what's the difference here? All I could, see, my eyes, I only saw color difference. So I'm only buying yellow mums now. <laughs> Very good. 
Um, we've got another question here. It's a little bit longer one, so bear with me. It says, I read that we should choose regionally appropriate species of milkweeds to ensure the success of monarch habitat. Species of milkweed that do well in western Kansas would not necessarily thrive in eastern Kansas. Do you have recommendations for certain milkweeds in our region of Kansas? Well, um, I kind of understand that. And um, that's the butterfly milkweed just works beautifully. The swamp milkweed produced a beautiful plant. Uh, I now have that showy milkweed, which is producing a beautiful plant. And then that wild one that just planted itself is fine. I want, here's my thought about it. And I've tried to grow the, the one that's actually, uh, you grow as an annual because it's not from here, that, uh, uh, the tropical milkweed. I want a variety of milkweed. I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket. Since I've had trouble having a source of milkweed food for them, I want to have many, I want to have a good stand of many different kinds of milkweed to kind of protect them from a failure of mine. And I think that's good advice because you mentioned earlier in the presentation how the weather from year to year, some of those milkweeds thrive in a little bit cooler conditions and some of them don't. And so that's right. I think that's a, a good game plan and that's something I know I strive for in my backyard, but don't necessarily always achieve, but they're looking better this year than they have in the past. I'm happy about that. Um, so the next question is, and kind of from this, I believe the same person, as a follow-up question, how about how many different types of milkweed should, should people try for if they're going to try for a variety? Now, that kind of depends on your garden, how much space you have. I have a lot of space. So I am, I have multiple gardens and I'm trying, I am keeping the patches separate. So I have a patch of common milkweed and then I have a place for showy milkweed and I have play, a place for uh, the swamp milkweed that I hope will finally take on, uh, take off. But the, um, if you don't have a lot of space, I think you make your choices. You say, I have this spot and that spot and I'll grow what I can there. Remember, I showed you my pathetic garden and it still produced one butterfly that I know of. Yep, so, I, think, I think that's any, a great answer. Any, anything that you can do will help this species. And remember, anything you do will help the other insects, uh, the other butterflies, uh, the, the bees, all of them. And it's important that you understand the butterfly is not an effective pollinator. Your real pollinators are those bees and wasps and beetles. Yeah, and I think that surprises a lot of people that those, the, the, the beetles and things that we don't necessarily think of when we think pollinators really do a lot of that important pollination service. Um, the next question comes from, uh, it, what about butterfly bushes? And I'm not exactly sure what they meant by that, but I think especially probably more for the flower. Is that a good food source? It turns out the butterfly bush is a wonderful plant and the butterflies love it. But because of that climate change issue, um, it apparently produces multiple thousands of seeds every year. And should the climate in Kansas change, it might become invasive. So what I've read is that maybe what we would do is don't let it seed. Don't let those butterfly bushes seed. But I've also heard that some of the plants now being produced um, don't seed. However, that makes me wonder, then do they not have pollen? Do they not have nectar? Uh, because if they don't, they're not any good for your butterflies. But uh, people, they just have wonderful success with those bushes. And, it's, and right now, they're not dangerous in Kansas. It's if the climate would change, they would probably become invasive because of the, the huge number of seeds they produce. Yeah, I would agree with you because I think they're, if you travel to some of the coasts, they're popping up in the side of the highway, which is yes. need to fathom that you could get a beautiful bush in the side of the highway and a crack in the concrete. But People in Oregon hate them. <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but I do think they're a great pollinator plant for our area. I agree with you there. Um, well, I don't see any more additional questions. Well, we can give it just a minute to see if there's any last questions. Just tons of positive comments about how great your presentation was and uh, how, how happy people are to participate tonight. So I, I thank you very much. I forgot I was talking to a screen. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Eventually, because this is a mission of mine, I believe strongly that backyard gardeners are vital uh, for the future of North American wildlife, not just the monarch, the insects and the animals that live off of the insects. Well, I don't see any additional questions. So Julie, I think we'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Great. I want to thank Denise Craig for her presentation tonight. I also want to thank Matthew McKernan and Angela Maben from K-State Extension for helping with tonight's program. Uh, we hope that you will take a little time to uh, share your thoughts with us on the survey form that was included on the email that had the link to tonight's program. Uh, these surveys are used by the library to not only see what your experiences were like, but also to find out what your suggestions are for future programming. Um, if you enjoyed your time tonight, then we have another uh, fall gardening uh, program next week. Um, this one is going to be on gardening with native plants. If you would like to register for that program, a quick and easy way to do it is to go to wichitalibrary.org slash gardening. Thanks for joining us this evening, and this will end today's presentation.